Jesus, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you all for leading us in worship this morning. Good to see you in the house of the Lord today on this great Lord's Day as we do proclaim the name of Jesus. Amen. And all that we do and all that we say and, and how we live. Well, I don't know if you're aware that this rancher got a visit one day. He was up in years and had a big ranch in Texas and a DE agent showed up and came up to his ranch and said, he introduced himself, showed his badge and said, I'm a DEA agent, that's Drug Enforcement Administration and I'm here to check out your ranch and there's a want to make sure there's no drugs being grown anywhere on your ranch. And so the, the rancher said, well, sure, you know, but I, I would advise you don't go back on that portion of the, listen, you see this badge? This is a federal badge, I can go anywhere I want on your property. So I understand, but I just wanted to warn you, back there on that portion, did you hear me? I'm going to have to show you this badge again. This badge gives me the power and the right to go anywhere, anytime, any place on your property I want to go. This badge says I've got the authority. Shows him the gate, and off he goes. The rancher goes back to mending fence and doing it. A little bit later, he hears this scream. I mean, as loud as could be, and he looks at his ranch and here that DE agent is running as fast as he can and his big Santa Gertruda bull with big old horns is after him and he's gaining ground and that agent doesn't look like he's going to make it to a tree or a fence in time. He is just screaming and running, screaming and running. The rancher drops his tools there at the fence, goes up and hollers, Your badge! Show him your badge! <laughs> so, so, so. That DE agent might have started well in his career, but he didn't end well. And uh, just the opposite, Paul may not start his walk very good in life when he persecuted the church, but he did finish well because in Acts 20, 24, Paul said, so that I may finish my course, the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, we know that Acts 20, where Paul's entering into the last times of his life, and he would make this statement that uh, he's going to finish well. And uh, we need to finish well in our life. And so I began to look at the passages before this passage and said, you know, what is it there that I can learn uh, from Paul of how I can finish well, how we can finish well? How, how can we finish our life well? And so this morning, that is the title of the message, Finishing Life Well. Wherever you are in life, you only have from today on to live anyway, so finish it well. If you're 13 or 3 or 103 this morning, finish it well. That's all you can do is finish well, you, you, however you started. And so we're going to begin to look at this passage. We look initially at Paul gives us the location and the audience which he's directly speaking to. Uh, Melodis is where he is, uh, and he sent to Ephesus. That's where he's going to send for the, the elders and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time. So here, here he is in uh, Miletus, and he's get, getting, uh, he must have sent messengers, obviously, to get the elders to come meet him. And he knows, and they know, this will be the last conversation they'll ever have together because pretty soon he'll be in Jerusalem and he won't be coming back. And so he's going to share with them a few words uh, that they can take back and share with their people about what he said. I don't know about you, if somebody told you these are the last words you'll ever speak to this group of people, I'd make it count. I'd make it count. If somebody said, you're never going to see these people again because once you go to Jerusalem, you're going to die. Uh, what, are you, what are you going to tell these folks? And uh, I think we need to focus in on what, what he said. What he said from this comma on is going to be crucial to how he finished well and how we finish well. And I think in this passage, we can find four things that Paul had to finish well, that we need to have to finish well. And they are serving resolve, shrink resistance, spirit radar, and sacrificial readiness is how we need to finish well because that's what he had in these passage for him to finish that way. Let's look at the first one, which is serving resolve. He said, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. So we see that one thing, the first thing, 
is that we have to have a serving resolve. I'm resolving to serve the Lord. There's something I need to do once I've been saved and I need to put myself into service for the Lord. Not just attendance, uh, not just being, but doing. I need to be serving in some capacity the Lord because that's who he was serving. Verse 19 says, not just serving others, I'm serving the Lord. And when you do serve others, you are serving the Lord because you're serving the Lord's people and those people who eventually will become his children, the lost, that you want to witness to. And so we can see if we break this down that Paul served, but he mentions three ways he served. In this passage, we see that he served with humility, with all humility. Why? Because you can't serve in pride. You know what pride says? Serve me. Minister to me. Do for me. Bring me something. Do something for me. Buy me something. Help me with something. I mean, that's, so it is a blessing to be served. Now, I'm not going to tell you it's not. But if you don't have any humility, that's all you want to do is bring it on and not give it out. You know, you hear a lot of people say, well, uh, I need a church where I can receive. And we do. We need to get messages and words and, and things. We got to receive. I'm not putting that down. But that's just half the equation. You should say, I'm looking for a church where I can receive so that I can give. I'm going to find a church where I can give and serve and love and minister and all those things. That's, that's just half the question because serving is the only way you can finish well and you've got to do it in humility so that you can serve and maybe sometimes not be served. And while we are serving, I believe the Lord encourages people to serve us and minister to us. But it's in the midst of our serving that we, we get ministry too. See, Paul called himself in his humility at one time, he called himself the least of all the apostles. I'm the least one. He called himself the least of all the saints, but the chief of all the sinners. You know, I'm the least of all the apostles. I'm the least of every saint, but I'm the best. Well, I guess you'd call it the worst of all the sinners. If you want to rank the sinners as the worst down to the least, put me at there at the top because I'm the worst of the worst. I persecuted the church. I had God's people killed and imprisoned. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm the chief. Well, look at that humility there. There's no pride there. I, he's not there to show off or to do. He's just saying, I, I serve the Lord out of humility. I've never claimed that I could do anything. It's all been the Lord. See, a lot of people look at this and they say, that kind of matches me. I, I can't do anything. I'm a nobody. I don't have any skills. I don't have a talent. So, Brother Tim, that's why I don't serve. That's the exact reason. I, I have so much humility. I have more humility than, than uh, Paul did. That's why I don't serve at all. Who am I? Somebody with me that I don't have any skills. I don't have any talents. I don't have anything to offer. So, I don't serve, but praise God, I'm humble. That's just a way, another way of saying I'm proudful. Because it's not me, it's Him through me. I just make myself available, and it's Him working through me that works my ministry and my life and my service. You're right, I'm like you, I can't do anything. But He can do something through me. And through my availability, I can be used by a mighty God. So that's just false humility. That's pride with a different face on it. And the Lord said, he's just saying, humble yourself before me and let me use you. And then he gets the glory. Why? Because it wasn't us. It was him. So we can't take any credit for it. We've got to give it to him and praise the Lord for that. You see, see, what a lot of people do is they look at different people in the church and say, I can't do that. And I know I can't do that. And I can't sing. And I can't do that. And I know I can't do that. Well, quit looking at what you can't do in service and looking what you can do. You know, there's a lot of different ways to serve the Lord. They're just like in your kitchen, there's a lot of different appliances. Amen? And they all do something different, but praise the Lord, you got them all. You know, and if the toaster's over there going, I sure wish I could cool food like that refrigerator does over there. <laughs> if it did, I'd work around this kitchen if I could cool food like that refrigerator. I really would be somebody. 
everybody would open me and close me and the light would come on automatically. I just, if I could just have the talent of that refrigerator. But all I am is this toaster. And all I know how to do is toast, toast. But one of these days, maybe I'll get the skill and the talent to cool food, but until then, I'm not going to even do anything. Look, just toast, toast. The manufacturer of the refrigerator designed it to cool food. The manufacturer of the toaster designed it to toast, toast. So if you're not toasting toast, and you're busy not toasting toast, then the kingdom of God doesn't have toast. Why? Because you're wanting to be a refrigerator. And all of us at church are missing toast. Because you won't get busy doing what the manufacturer of you designed you to do. We got cool food around here, but I'd sure like to have a little toast every now and then. Sure would make things a lot better. But if you're not doing it, and God made you to do it, the body of Christ is hindering from you not toasting toast. When that's what God designed you to Quit looking at what everybody else is doing. That's not what is important. Let the toast, toast, to toaster, toast, toast. That's hard to say. And let the refrigerator refrigerate and let the stove, stove and the oven, oven and do its things. And boy, the kitchen operates as the person over the kitchen gets it all in order to make delicious food, which we all enjoy. So we all have a way to serve. We can't get to heaven and say, well, we didn't have what it took. He... He made us what we made us to do what we can do to accomplish what He wants to accomplish in the body of Christ for His honor and glory. We just got to get busy. And then it said, He said He was serving with tears. I don't believe these were so much tears for Himself. You don't see that much. Paul's always in tears for others. These were other people. Yeah, when you're in ministry, you get so involved sometimes in other people's need and going through things and death and heartache and illness and ministry and you're just there and, and you just yes you bear their burden and sometimes you are down and, and tearful because you're serving Paul said I, I served with tears many times it, it does sometimes make you tearful because when you're involving yourself in other people's life you're not even crying for you you're crying for them a lot of people come in for counsel that are so, 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 so down. They're saying, I just can't, I can't seem to get out of the depression. Well, I got you 10 tips. Go do 10 good things for somebody else in ministry, and then that'll be lifted because you'll be crying and weeping and, and hurting for them, and it seems to lift your own spirits as you're reaching out to help others that are in need. And then he said, I, in that passage, he said, I was serving with trials. Trials. They do come. Amen. Well, we got one person that's walking through some trials, but all of us walk through trials. Amen. But you know what a lot of people say, Brother Tim, I'll start serving when things kind of settle down and I don't have so much trials and suffering going on in my own life. Well, you're not going to serve at all. I mean, the trials are kind of like the proverbial carrot before the horse. It just seemed like a carefree, trial-free life is just a, a week away, maybe another week away, but every time that horse steps one step, it goes a little further away, and it just seems like there's just some little gaps in between us going through different and various trials. You can't wait till the trial's over. I mean, you may have something, well, I have to step aside for a week or two. That's not what I'm saying, but just to say I'm waiting for a carefree life, that... That's not going to happen. Paul said, I just served with trials, with tears, with humility. I didn't wait for the trial to be over. Paul, I, you never read anywhere where he was without trial. I mean, he was beaten and shipwrecked and went without food and, and just on and on and on. All the whole scriptures that he would have quit years ago. So you have to do it with trials. You see, we have a mission at the church. We have a mission as a Christian, and that's to do what Jesus did, to seek and save that which was lost, to love God and to love others. We have a mission to accomplish, not just to be in attendance, but to be part of a mission team to reach our world for Christ. Many of you may be familiar about a big church in Georgia called North Point uh, Community Church, big church in, in Georgia. And uh, the staff was meeting one time, and 
Uh, one of the person, they were a large enough church to just have somebody on staff that, you know, put up all the signs on the marquees and everything there at the church. And, and the guy in charge of the marquee didn't have enough letters to completely put all of what they asked him to put on, so he did a little abbreviation uh, on the marquee. And that the staff came together, they found out from somebody what their church sign said, that when he wrote everything, whatever he was supposed to put at the bottom, North Point Community Church, well, he couldn't put that all on the last line, so he abbreviated North. So now everybody drove by the church and it said, No Point Community Church. No point. You know, the staff was saying, man, of all things, you know, for him to abbreviate that one, you know, there's no point to our church. We're just a no point church. But you know, every church that's not doing the will of God and the ministry of God, does it have a point? Is it a no point church? Are we no point people? Not if we love God and love others and we're letting God use us to minister to others and not just receive, but to give in service. We see the mission of the church fulfilled as we are a light to the world. He even later on said in verse 23, which we'll read in a minute, bonds and affliction await me. We can see that trials always accommodated everything that he did. And then Paul was shrink had shrink resistance. Paul said in verse 20, how I did not shrink. Paul said, I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you public and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. This word shrink is the word hupostello, used 27 times. Uh, It means to draw back. 1986, when Rebecca and I took our honeymoon, we went to Acapulco, Mexico, and there, while we were there, you know, you like to do sometimes a little bit of buying, and, you know, of course, you can barter and deal with, you know, the people down there to get the, the best deal, and And so I end up getting 10 real pretty t-shirts, no, five pretty t-shirts for 10 bucks. I was so proud of myself, $2 a piece, man. I did so good, you know, I mean, I was just so proud of my purchase and real, real nice, nice t-shirts. And, you know, so off we got back home and I was anxious to wear them. So Rebecca washed these shirts and so she did and dried them. And when I got them, now to where I, I felt like donating them to the local kindergarten class. <laughs> you talking about midriff showing? I mean, it's like you want your midriff. Needless to say, that those shirts were pretty much gone. So they shrunk. They were once big, the right size for use, but through agitation in that washing machine and water and. And heat in that dryer, they just, whoop, this little bitty. They shrunk up. You see, Paul said, when I minister for Christ, I didn't shrink. Isn't that is what you feel like when you're getting under pressure? At school, at work. Gosh, I want to say this. I want to minister, I want to stand, but they're going to make fun of me and they're not going to let me in the lounge and they're not going to make me part of their group and they're going to say you nutball and you idiot and you fanatic and all these names that they're going to uh, and boy you can feel yourself in the dryer just shrinking and shrinking back stand your ground we all have to stand our ground and not shrink Paul said I didn't shrink I stood my ground in the midst of persecution in the midst of being laughed at and ridiculed but isn't that what happens to us I may lose that promotion I may be made fun of I, I don't I don't I want to be part of the group but I want to be liked and admired and it causes us just to shrink back Proverbs gives us this warning for the fear of man brings a snare but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted you fear what everybody else thinks it's a snare it's a trap 
We need to fear God and trust God. And I know we all face this temptation. All of, all of us want to be liked. I've never met anybody that said, Brother Tim, I like to be hated. I, I like to be unpopular. I like to be not included. It just brings me great joy when people say negative things about me and call me names. It just it does something for me. I've never met anybody that said, we're all men of like passion. We're all like to be liked. And when we're not, what do we do? Well, we do what Paul says in Galatians, for I am not, I, for am I, am, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. That's what happens every time I face that temptation. If I shrunk, I pleased men. And if I didn't shrink, I pleased God. And there's a few times that we are able to do both. I mean, those are great times when we minister to somebody and we please them and we please God. That's a plus plus. That's a win-win. That's great. But there's a lot of times it's either one or the other. God or men. I said, boy, I left away from that deal and those people are probably never going to speak to me again. Uh, I'm going to be unpopular. School, they probably won't invite me to anything. But you walk home and you know you've pleased your Lord. And that's what you ought to be uh, rejoicing in. That you chose rather to please God than to please men or even please yourself. That's what it's all... But it all comes down to not shrinking. Now, we don't do that in arrogance. We don't do that vindictively and mean and mean-spirited. You always do it in love and compassion, but you still don't shrink. You've got to take your stand. But see, that's where the issue is. You and I have to make our decision before we get out there to face that temptation. Because if you're in it and then decide to make up your mind, you will shrink. You can't have any indecision before you even go. You have to have your mind made up. You know what? I don't think... Most squirrels die because they're, 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 they try to cross the, the street. Squirrels die in the street because they run out there and go. <laughs> they, I, don't, I don't know why that's in every squirrel's brain. You, know, you see them, they'll run out and they go, oh, I'm, you're 20 feet in front of me. And then they get run over, you know. It's indecision that kills the squirrel. If they'd just run across, they'd be fine. Or run across, but they get right out in the middle and think. <laughs> of course, you don't know which way to go as a, if you're really compassionate. You don't know whether to go right or left because you don't know what. And then sometime you do it, you know. <laughs> and it, it happens. Make up your mind, squirrel. Go or come or do something or wait there till I pass. So it's, that's what we do with the shrinkage. We're there and you're in that situation. Should I say, oh, should I do or not? Oh, 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 oh. And then you leave back and you think, man, I shrunk. But if you make your mind up saying, I'm crossing that street. Here we go. Help me, Lord, to have the strength to stand my ground. And boy, you cross the street. You know, otherwise you get in the snare of the the snare of men and you get whacked by the proverbial car for your indecision for Christ. So I guess if you walk away with anything, don't be like a squirrel. So anyway, <laughs> spirit radar is another thing that Paul had to finish well. And now behold, bound by the spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what's going to happen to me. It doesn't matter, I'm shrink resistant. Except the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and affliction await me. Paul had this spirit radar. He, he knew what, what the spirit wanted him to do. You know, it says bound, uh, dedimenos, to bind or put something under obligation. I was bound by the spirit. And this word spirit it can mean the Holy Spirit and it can mean just our own spirit. You see it capitalized there. Some theologians who've looked at this and linguistic experts say it possibly could be Paul's spirit and not the Holy Spirit. Uh, you can look at, first of all, the other versions, the uh, English Standard Version, constrained by the Spirit, NIV, compelled by the Spirit, uh, the 
New Revised Standard Version, captive to the Spirit. And we can even look at the Amplified, which they try to kind of mix both if it could be either one. Bound by the Holy Spirit and obligated and compelled by the convictions of my own spirit. So either way, it still has to do with Paul's spirit was bound to the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit wanted him to do. That's what I have to have my spirit align with the spirit leading and to do what God's asked me to do. So it's the Holy Spirit, I believe, compelling me to do and if I make myself obligated to do what the Spirit's leading. This is where a lot of people don't finish well. The Spirit's not leading their life. You know what really leads most of our life? It's easy, what I want to do and what I don't want to do. <laughs> I mean, if you, let's just be honest. That's really what our flesh is. I want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to spend my money there. I don't want to. Well, that's okay, but is that what the Spirit leads me to do? Not my Spirit, but is my Spirit lining up with His Spirit to do what His Spirit wants and not what my Spirit wants? Paul said, look, I am bound that I'm obligated to do in my spirit what the Holy Spirit is leading me to do. He, he had spirit radar. You know, just he was guided and turned and directed, stop when he was supposed to stop, go when he was supposed to go, turn when he was supposed to turn, say when he was supposed to say, be quiet when he's supposed to be quiet. That's being led and controlled and bound by the Holy Spirit. Even knowing that when the Spirit was telling him, if you go to Jerusalem, you're, this is what you're going to face. It's going to be bonds and affliction. He still went. It didn't say the Holy Spirit told him not to go. The Holy Spirit told him, here's what's going to happen when you go. And it was still God's will for him to go. That's being bound by the Spirit. I don't know about you. That's just a constant prayer of mine is, Lord, I don't want to miss you. <laughs> I don't want to go there. If you say go there, I, but I need to know and I want the Spirit to show me what to do because I know I want to do what I want to do. But I want to do what you're leading me to do because that's going to work out best. You know, we look at several examples of this. Simeon, we know the story of Simeon and, and it, had, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen Christ Jesus. He knew he wouldn't. The, God, the Spirit said, you're not going to die until you see that baby Jesus. You're going to see the Christ child before you die. And then that verse went on to say this. It said, and he came in the Spirit to the temple. It's one thing the Holy Spirit say you're going to see Christ when he dies, but what if you're not where he is? So he went in the Spirit to the temple. I believe the Spirit directed him to go to the temple when it was time to go to the temple so that he'd run into Jesus. A lot of people say, I'm going to do this because it's what I want to do. I know one particular person one time said, I'm going to go to another church because they got more singles. I said, did the Lord lead you to the church you're in? Yeah. And so you're going to just go there just for that reason? Is the Lord leading you there? Well, I can't say that He is, but they got more singles and I won't be married. Uh, so that's, that's okay to have that go, but let's say this. If God led you to this church and you want to go to that church because you just want to go, and the time you're away from this church, the person you're supposed to marry would be here because He led you here and in the direction of your life, you may miss the person that He has for you. Because you want to do what you want to do instead of what God wants you to do, but God still may want to have what He has for you, but always in the leading of the Spirit. And I didn't say it like that. I mean, that's a sermon voice, but you know what I'm saying. You know, I said, said it gently, you know, to try. But she said, I'm going anyway, because my goal is this. Let's see, your goal ought to be the Spirit leading and let God, He'll direct you. But you may miss the very thing you're looking for. You see, we've got to be led by the Spirit. Jesus was led around. He was led around by what? The Spirit. Philip, then the Spirit said to Philip. See, if you listen, he speaks. Peter, the Spirit said to him. Acts eleven twelve. 12, the Spirit told me to go. Peter, Silas, and Timothy, forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak a word in Asia. Don't say a word there. And then later on, the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them 
In other words, they were led by the Spirit, all these people. And they listened to the Spirit. And the Spirit told them, boy, isn't that what we want as Christians? For the Spirit to say, don't, don't go there. Go there. Don't do that. Don't do that. Do that. Go there. That's, I want that leadership. I want to hear. I want Spirit radar. Like Paul said, if that I'm hearing from the Spirit, See, if we're in sin, we're in rebellion, we're wanting to do our own thing, we just tune that out. And you say, everything's working okay for me. I'm doing what I want to do. I'm pretty smart. I'm pretty educated. I do what I think's best for me. Well, good luck on that. Because I don't know the future, and neither do you, but God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, they already are in the future. They already been there, done that, and so they can give me a little instruction to say, this would be their best move, because we're already seen down there. And here's how it looks, so we'll give you a little foreknowledge. Because we already know how you need to act. Wouldn't you love the future? Well, I just can't pick the right stock. You would if you already been in the future. I don't know what the, what the best career is. You'd know if it was you already did in the future. I don't know what to make this decision. You would if you knew the future. And guess what? I know somebody knows the future. God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'll just listen to Him. Spirit radar. That's what Paul had. So he knew what direction. To go. You know, I began to contemplate this even yesterday while I was driving. You know, it's like, Lord, I just don't want to miss you. Lord, give me something. I just, I just was battling with this one deal to say, what is it that keeps me from hearing you? I mean, we've all done things saying, man, I miss God there. <laughs> you know, I go back to that passage. Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. You know? And you begin to think, okay, not this one, but this one. And he was given the analogy that to be filled with the Spirit means to let the Spirit control you uh, the way people let alcohol control them. And they get filled and filled and filled. And the more they get filled with alcohol, the more the alcohol controls them and the less they control themselves. And Paul says, don't do that, but let me give you that as an illustration. The more and more and more and more you get filled by the Spirit, the more and more it controls you and the less you control yourself. And the Lord spoke to me real clearly like that that's what it is when I'm missing. I'm full of me and I miss God. But when I feel, 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 man, the Holy Spirit's in control and almost none of me is in control. And the Spirit's leading me, guiding me, directing me because He's in control because I let Him fill me, not with alcohol, but with His Holy Spirit. And so I can hear him clearly. I can hear when he speaks. I can hear when he says stop and go because of that filling. And not me, what I want, but what he wants. So I empty myself out of me and fill with him. But when I don't, it seems like I do what I want. And I can't hear what he wants. The last thing, he had sacrificial resolve. Sacrificial resolve. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul focused on accounting. As Christians, we're all supposed to be accountants. You mean of what? Of our life. He said, uh, any account. I took an account of my life. I begin to look and look at the, the additions, subtractions, the, the assets, the liabilities. I begin to look at my life and to put it under an accounting microscope. And here's what I found out. I didn't consider my life of any account as dear to myself. See, if we hold our own life too dear to ourselves, we miss God. Did you catch that? I mean, that's just the way it is. Our flesh wants to just think of, oh, my life is so dear to me. You know, I've told you before, and just the Lord had just brought it up to me, you know, when I was in my later teens, you know, I began to race motocross and raced it for about four years, and very dangerous sport. Matter of fact, so dangerous, my mom went to every one of my races, and after I... Um, hung it up after four years, she let me know, I never watched one of your races. 
as a parent now, I know what you meant. I, she was there at every one. She was in the bleachers every year at one. But when my little race came, she had to excuse herself. That's how dangerous it was. And I began racing. You know, it's like, man, I was, you know, they had 30 people in the class, you know, and, you, you know, coming back to, you know, say, hey, what'd you do? I did 10. Well, you didn't do any good. Well, 30 people, you know. It's like, I began to realize, who are these people out front? Who are the knights, eight, seven, six? What are they doing? I, I, I'm practicing. I'm doing all I can. Maybe I just wasn't talented, but I began to think of myself, you know what? And, and if I'd have known this first, I'd have found out what the answer for me was. Tim, your life is too dear to yourself. I mean, I just had this deal of saying, I don't want to die. I don't want to be crippled. I don't want to break any bones, which I saw plenty of my friends do. I don't want to have a concussion. I don't want to break my neck. I like my life. I like that I can walk and I'm not crippled. I, you know, I like that I, I, can, I don't have any broken ribs and bones. You know, I'm kind of holding my life dear to myself. So I said, that's enough of that. And I said, I'm going to race like I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to be a maniac on a motorcycle. Because it's either I don't have enough skill or that's it. Seventh, fifth, third, second, first, first, second, first, first, second, third, fourth, first, first, second, third. I mean, it just all came together. Praise God, I'm here not dead. And I wouldn't suggest that to anybody because all those other guys may have had talent and I didn't. But when I said, my life's not dear to myself, I'm going to ride faster than it's really safe. I mean, of course, everybody's riding faster and safe, but I'm just going to ride where I'm going to die. Now, I'm not saying go out and die, but Paul's saying that same analogy here. Is your life so dear to yourself you don't want to sacrifice for the Lord? And yes, there may be a time that somebody says, Christ or die. But let me say, that's probably not going to happen in America. So let's, it may. It may. But don't wait for that. That's like when we tell everybody, you know, sacrifice for your wife. And some men are saying, if I go out in the parking lot and my wife's in there and the guy said, I'm going to shoot your wife and I'm going to jump in front of her and ooh, take that bullet. Well, that's good for you, but how often does that happen? Why don't you sacrifice every day a little bit for her? You know, I mean, that may happen, but, you know, of course they're not sacrificing. They're waiting for that event to happen, you know. And that may never happen. In that same way, we may not ever face that bullet for Christ. But let's sacrifice up until then. And not count ourselves so dear to ourselves that we miss that because anything worth doing is going to have some sacrifice. Don't tell me, I'm going to go get a college degree, but I'm not going to sacrifice anything. You know, I'm going to get a new house built, but I'm not going to sacrifice anything. You know, anything that you're going to do that's going to be worth anything is going to take some sacrifice. And serving the Lord, let's expect already to say, I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to have sacrificial resolve. Because I'm a runner, and every runner has an objective. I've never saw any runner at the starting line at the Olympics, and they say, well, give us a little bit. I'm just wanting to make it around the track. And it doesn't matter what time I do. Just, I'm just out for a walk, you know. What's your objective? Just to get out and enjoy the scenery and see all the fans. I love to hear them cheer and all that. And I'll probably be watching them while I'm racing. No, they have an objective. It's to be first place. All that other stuff fades away. I got an objective. Doesn't matter what happens. Objective. And that's what Paul had, an objective to run this course. Do you have, do I have an objective. He also was running the course. Do you notice in that whole passage is the word my life and the ministry? I went back and forth on the title of this message. I titled it Finishing the Ministry Well. I titled it Finishing the Life Well. Then I went back to Finishing Well and then Finishing the Life Well. Why? Because life and ministry to Paul was the same thing. <laughs> I mean, his life and what he did for the Lord, that was his life. Whether you're at home or whatever you're doing, he was doing it as a service to the Lord and all that he did. And also, our ministry is from the Lord. See, I don't have a ministry. The Lord, my ministry is from the Lord. Your ministry is from the Lord. It's not even yours. It's from the Lord. You got it from the Lord. 
So just do what He gave you from the Lord. Paul said, this ministry wasn't from me, it's from Him. And i got to be a good steward of what He gave me. Moreover, it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful. Are you faithful with what God gave you? He gave you money, He gave you, he gave you uh, time, and He gave you a ministry. Find out what it is and be faithful in doing it. Paul said, it was from the Lord. It wasn't even mine. And then he focused on witnessing. He said, I'm here to testify. He testified to everybody in his life and all that he had, he was a witness for Christ. All that were around him, he testified. And what does a witness do in court? They just say what they know and what they've seen. You know, Paul had heard and he had experienced. And that's all you got to do and say, here's what the Word said and here's what happened in my life and I just want to witness and testify for Christ. So he focused on being an accountant, a runner, and a witness. That's what I'm going to focus on. Why? Because I want to finish well. Now some of you may be thinking, you know, Brother Tim, that's fine, but I didn't start so well. I'm here where I am, and this happened in my life, and that happened in my life, and this negative happened, and this bad happened. You don't know what you're dealing with. I, I just didn't get a good start and I'm look here's some good news that you may think is bad news there's nothing you can do about your past nothing you can't go back one day and undo but you sure can start today and do something today and the days ahead till you finish that finish line whether in death or in rapture you can do like any runner you fall down, get up and run faster than you ever run in your entire life till you hit that finish line. You say, yeah, but it, I think it's too messed up. You know, in 1954, there were two rookies that were playing their first game as a rookie in Major League Baseball. I mean, don't you know that's a nervous time? Your first game as a rookie in Major League Baseball. One of those two rookies was... Four for four. I mean, what non-rookie goes 100% at the plate? Four hits, four times at bat. For a rookie. I mean, if you hit three, uh, you bat a 300, that means you hit, you know, three times out of 10, you're good in Major League Baseball. And for you to go 100% as a rookie, that's unheard of. The other rookie... 0 oh, for 4. He didn't get a hit one. Say, so tell us, Brother Tim, we, we won't know. I bet we can identify that first guy. Anybody that knows 4 for 4 in the major league their first time as a rookie, man, they must have been an all American I mean, they must have done all the awards that you could get in baseball. His name, the 4 for 4 guy, Jim, Jim Greengrass. Anybody heard of him? That's the 4 for 4 guy. You say, well, tell us the other one, but we wouldn't, you know, who he is. Somebody that that's sorry, that's that bad an athlete that he can't even hit once. Well, his name was Hank Aaron. <laughs> 33 years held the home run record. 0 for 4, first time at bat. I think he finished well, don't you, Hank? <laughs> no, I think he finished very well. He didn't let a bad start keep him from having a good finish. Have a good finish. Start now. Don't waste any more time. I don't care if you're six or 106 in here. Don't waste any more time because you only got that much time to the finish line to do what you can do for Christ. Well, then we have to close with, well, I don't know if I want to do it. Is it that important? That's a lot of sacrificial resolve. That's a lot of a lot of things you've put on our plate, serving resolve and shrink resistance, spirit radar and sacrificial readiness. Is it really that important? Let me ask you this. If you sent your kids to some event where they were there, let's say a week away from you, and they came back, well, how'd it go? They didn't feed us hardly anything but bread and water, and that not every day. Really? Yeah. And they only gave us one hour sleep. Really? Yeah, and when we scraped our arm or 
had a cut or headache or whatever, no medical care at all. <laughs> and you'd go to meet with them. With, after that week, you go meet with the ministers and you know, you'd go up to them and say, well, that's fine, you did that to my child. It's not that important. No, you wouldn't. You'd say, that's neglect. You neglected my children. That is a big deal. Now, your mama bear and your papa bear instinct would come out. You know, you'd say, Lord, just forgive me for one minute. I need to, you know, you know, you know. okay, I was going to stop. You know, you'd want to do that because that's your children. It is important. You wouldn't say it's not important. And then if somebody, just the opposite, gave your kid a scholarship or help your kid find a job or help your kid go somewhere or did something good for your child, oh, man just blesses you beyond measure, doesn't it? You'd rather that happen than your own self getting blessed. How do you pray when you pray? The Lord told us how. Our Father, which art in heaven, He has children to which you and I need to minister to. It ain't important, Brother Tim! Well, you seem like it was important to you you almost got in the cub state and the bear state after they did that. They neglected your children. You got a little fasty. Yeah, but God understands. That's just His children. Excuse me? I don't think you hear what you're saying. Just His children? See, He loves when His children are ministered to by other of His children. He loves when you minister to those people who aren't in His or aren't even his children yet, but you're trying to bring them in to make them his children. He loves that. Big time too. And he sure doesn't like when his children are neglected. He wants us all to be doing what we've been called to do, whether it's refrigerator stuff or toaster stuff. Let's just be doing what God's called us to do so that his children are not neglected because we're doing what God's called us to do, created us to do, made us to do from the womb on to win the lost and to minister to his children. Why? So we can finish well. We're all going to finish. Some will finish well and some not. We're all going to finish. You do know that everybody dies. I just, in case we did. We all die, so we're all going to finish. But are you going to finish well? It all depends on what your accounting is. Well, I got a good job, got a good home, got a good retirement, I made this, I did this, I did this, I did this. Well, that's good, but did, what did you do for Christ and for His church and for His kingdom? Did you finish well? Paul did, and I want the things that Paul had in his life. Stand as we have this moment of invitation as our music team comes.